This video is brought to you by all of my wonderful patrons. If you want to help support the channel and get yourself some pretty cool perks, as well as a direct line of communication with me via our private Discord, make sure you check out the description for a link. And let's get into the stories. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms, and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine and saw someone in the bathroom. I said, Hello? Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason, and then I saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, What are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked. How it still worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. This woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and I said, What's in the bag? Thinking it was probably my stuff. And so she said, No, no, it's just my things. It's just my things, I'll show you. And she did. I looked and I didn't see anything of mine. And since I'm obviously in shock at the time, I let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went into the bathroom and I saw my underwear, my bikini, and my clothes shoved in my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. Then I looked at the counter and I saw that she had gotten into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at that moment other than I wanted it back so I ran out the door to find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out the sides of the hotel and I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her, so my coworker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what had happened and then we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait and I noticed there was a metal bat on my bed, a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats you get at a baseball game. But there's also a flashlight on the end, she must have left it behind in a hurry. She also left a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought she'd gotten away with my medication that I needed. The police got there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink, and I pointed it out to the cops, but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door and windows to see if she had pried her way in somehow, but there was nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front desk was adamant that there was no way that could be. The officer that came brought two more officers as backup because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity, but after our statements were taken there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to people. And as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking about the drywall in the sink, and it still didn't make sense to me. So I'm on the phone and looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right behind it, and then it hit me. I got my coworker and asked her to help me pull the mirror off the wall. And we took the mirror down and there's a hole just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I had found this and my boss said, there's still two cops in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kind of rolled her eyes, but the young guy said, I'll come check it out. They both came up and looked in the hole and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, and toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for God knows how long. She had access to me and my room at all times. I know it might be hard to picture. There was a crawl space about two feet wide in between the two rows of rooms. 
One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to him what was going on, and all I heard over the radio is, no fucking way. He comes back, takes pictures, and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously, we packed and left immediately. What's even crazier is she probably had been there a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke, and I just assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom and it was traveling through the vents. But nope, a junkie was smoking just on the other side of the mirror. She had access to other rooms too. The holes in the walls were from a renovation, and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered it up with mirrors. So they could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone. Anyway, this was insane and I'm taking a little time off. And the photo you see right now is a photo of the hole. My husband and I were at the supermarket and our baby was being especially fussy. So he took her for a quick drive, the motion of which usually calms her down. It only took about 10 minutes to settle her and I was still in the store, but was unsure how much longer I'd be and there's poor cell reception inside. So he pulled back into the parking lot to wait for me. It was an unseasonably nice day, so he took her in her car seat to sit on one of the benches outside of the store. He took a business call and had just sat down, absent-mindedly rocking the carrier, when a woman well-dressed in her mid-thirties, average height with a fit build, approached them. It's not uncommon for people to ask to play with our baby. Soft wisps of gold hair and the most adorable gurgly toothless grin, especially when she's deep into a good nap. But her nap schedule is paramount, so my husband was preparing to tell the woman that she actually couldn't play with our baby right then. She walked over right in their direction, brimming with nonchalant confidence. And before he can even finish his sentence explaining that she was napping and not to be touched, she picked up the carrier and started walking off. He was in shock for a minute, not fully believing someone would be ballsy enough to do something so sinister in plain daylight. So he said, Excuse me, put her down? As his panic mounted. She remained calm this entire time but when he called after her, she started walking away more briskly than when she'd approached. He ran full speed ahead trying to grapple the carrier out of her hands, finally resulting to restraining her arms. This woman yells, Help! He's trying to take my baby! Kidnapping! 911, help! Kicking him in the shin and pulling a pink bottle of pepper spray out of her handbag. Of course, no one in the parking lot was clocking the earlier interaction and assumed he was a kidnapper. A lone man in a Deadpool t-shirt versus a tiny well-dressed woman. Immediately a man knocked my husband to the ground and was holding him down. He could hear bystanders encouraging the woman to file a police report, but she was doing a very convincing job of acting shaken up and insisting she just wanted to go home. To make matters worse for my husband, she was driving a minivan. He was in a raw state of panic realizing that the entire parking lot had banded together to inadvertently facilitate the kidnapping of our daughter. He was begging and pleading with them, but no one was listening. They just kept screaming at him that the jig was up and he needed to lie still and wait for the police and stop terrorizing a young mother. My husband finally had the novel idea to show them family pictures on his phone. But, too panicked to think clearly, this manifested as him shouting, I have pictures of the baby on my phone! Which, of course, everyone interpreted as him either having stalking photos or, worse, pornographic images of the baby. It was at this point that a man, I can't entirely blame the man considering what he thought was going on, kicked my husband as hard as he could in the ribs. It was at this point I was coming out of the store and I thought he was being robbed by these people. I was yelling for security, so panicked my chest constricted and I could barely get any sound out. It was only then that I realized he did not have our baby with him. When I saw she was being held by a woman, I was relieved. I thought maybe the woman had intervened to move my daughter out of harm's way while my husband was being robbed and was walking away to get help. 
I couldn't find a security guard outside the store, so I ran up to the people holding my husband down, waving my wallet, pleading, Take everything you want, just let up and leave us alone. And one of the men holding him down said something like, Lady, we need to wait for the police to deal with him. And I was so confused. Why would the muggers call the police? I just kept stammering, What do you mean? What are you talking about? And made out someone saying, He tried to abduct this woman's kid. I did not understand and was sure I'd misheard him. My husband would never hurt a child. And we have four kids. If he was going to commit a crime, bringing home another kid would be at the bottom of his list. I kept trying to understand what the man was saying and suddenly it all clicked. I looked around for the woman who had the baby carrier and she was halfway across the parking lot. I went into total ballistic tiger cub mode, literally leapt out of my heels and sprinted across the parking lot. I'm not a UFC fighter. I've never even taken self-defense classes, so all I could do was grab the woman by her hair and squeeze her throat with my other hand. Which didn't do much, she was getting away even as I grappled with her. Amazingly, none of the other bystanders had yet connected that my husband was telling the truth and this woman was absconding with my baby. I yanked on her hair as hard as I could, and that was enough to make her drop the carrier. I was so scared and surprised that I actually just threw myself on top of the carrier, covering the entire thing with a blanket and staying that way without saying or doing anything else. The woman left. Not one person tried to stop her. Even though she was clearly leaving without the child she claimed was hers. Which would be pretty damn incriminating if I'd watched this scene unfold. Within the next couple of minutes the police had arrived. After all that there were still several bystanders who explained it as my husband trying to kidnap the baby. The police, to my horror, assumed that she must have not had bad intentions. The first questions they asked me after getting her descriptions weren't investigative. They were questions thinly veiled trying to convince me not to pursue charges, still placing blame on my husband. A small sampling. Does your husband and the baby look dissimilar? Is there a chance she thought he was abducting the baby and she was just trying to intervene? Could your husband have been doing something inappropriate or violent to the baby that could have made her feel compelled to extricate the baby from the situation? Did she seem droggy or confused? Could she have mistaken either of them for being her own family members? They spent more time verifying that the baby was actually mine than they concerned themselves with the fact that the baby was not actually hers. My husband had called his brother at this point who works in an office with a lot of lawyers and connected with one ASAP who gave us the priceless advice to get every officer's name and badge number, to request copy of the store security tapes right away and to escalate our complaint higher up the chain if these officers weren't taking us seriously. Finally, we had reason enough to believe we were being taken seriously, and we went home and we both just shook and cried until we got our other kids from school. My husband is seething with rage and grappling with a feeling of helplessness from how little he was able to do, and has two cracked ribs from the man that kicked him. To the officer's credit, they did ask if he'd like to press charges, but considering the man was genuinely convinced at the time that he was on the right side of intervening in a kidnapping, and stayed to talk to the police and apologized profusely when the truth became clear, he declined to press charges. Amazingly and frustratingly, there were still people who stuck around to talk to the police who were giving my husband dirty looks, and one man who even implored the police to involve CPS to verify it was really our baby. When I was seven or eight, my family went to the beach and rented a room. We had the kind of rooms where you rent out both and they are connected through a door. Like there's a door to leave the room and the doors into the other room. In the room connected to ours, there was this army family. A military dad, some kids, and a wife. My older sister was supposed to be watching me as we were down at the jacuzzi during the evening. As we're playing and hanging out and just having a good time, I didn't get out much, was naive, and all around a little kid. We're both white-skinned, blue eyes, and blonde hair. 
this mom literally sits in the jacuzzi with us. She starts talking to us and is just making herself real comfortable. I was a very naive kid. Eventually we start talking about books and she starts talking about her kids, who are never even seen, and we're just having a good conversation. Really in depth I felt like. My sister decides she wants to go back to the room, but I don't. I wanted to stay and talk with the mom. So my sister goes back to the room and now it's just 7 year old me and some 40 year old woman. It should have set off some creepy alarms, but it did not. She starts talking about going and walking on the beach. It's like 10 p.m. and she wants to go and walk on the beach and get shells. I thought it was a great idea. I get to walk on the beach at night. I felt so free and like a big kid. I didn't need my sister or anything. So I run back to my room and tell my grandparents that I'm walking on the beach with Sue, or whatever her name was. I remember my grandmother reading her book, barely listening to what I said. She just shooed me off. It is important to know that I didn't live with my parents. So I start walking down the creepy motel corridor. Really was a dark dim stairwell in a cheap motel on the beach. As I'm walking through the stairwell, the mom's at the very bottom telling me to hurry up and this and that. While walking down the stairs, army dad comes hauling ass to where I'm at. He told me, Your mom is calling you. It's really important, we gotta go. And basically grabbed me by my waist, softly but not aggressively, and led me back to our room. He knocked on the door and explained what happened. I never thought much of it till about a year ago when it came back to me. This woman was leading me away to go to the beach alone at night, and this army guy got a terrible feeling in his gut, so he intervened. As I don't live with my mom, when he said my mom was looking for me, it set off alarms in my head. That's when I realized something was up, so I didn't resist going back to my family. As a kid I knew since he was saying my mom wanted me, it was important. I'm now 20 years old and I truly believe that that mom was trying to lure me away to do god knows what, and this army dude had a bad feeling and saved my life. Thinking back, I get such a bad feeling all throughout my body. I know now that I wouldn't have made it back from that beach trip. Obligatory happened in college to start. My sophomore year I lived in the dorms and was assigned a random roommate. He seemed a little bit introverted, but fairly normal at first, but he really wouldn't talk to me. I would try to start conversations about things he showed interest in, but he only gave me one word answers that were obviously meant to end the conversation. I figured he probably just didn't like me, so I decided I'd give him space and leave him alone. After a few days, it started. I would notice that he was always looking in my direction. I chalked it up to coincidence, but it kept happening. Classes started up and I spent less and less time in my room, but whenever I was in there, he would be constantly looking in my direction. When I would turn to face him, he would turn his head away, but it would creep me out since it was pretty much constant. I started noticing that he would lay on his bed to read but he would always hold the book or papers at an angle that always gave him a direct line of sight to me. About a week or so into the semester, my girlfriend at the time and I were on a morning hike and crashed on my bed at around 2 p.m. We woke up to him standing there just staring at us two hours later. He didn't say anything, just turned and left the room. At that point I decided I needed to leave before he murdered me in my sleep and ate my face and I was out of there pretty quickly. Fortunately, I didn't see him again for quite a while, but we ended up having a class together senior year. I had been telling my friends the story ever since it happened, and they didn't believe me. One of my friends had really poor vision, so we sat in the front row. Of course, every time I looked behind me, my old roommate was staring directly at me. Not the teacher, but at me. It didn't matter if I was in the middle or on one of the sides. I challenged them to look back a single time during the semester and catch them not looking at me. 
Within five classes, they gave up and agreed that he was staring at me non-stop and he was super creepy. My parents think he was in love with me, but I think he still wanted to murder me in my sleep and eat my face. This happened eight years ago when I was a ten-year-old girl and my sibling only seven. My parents left us with a nanny because they went to go to a meeting. The nanny Carla would leave by ten after putting us to sleep and they would make it back by twelve. So there would be two hours in which no one was home except for us. Carla, then an eighteen or nineteen-year-old girl, was very sweet and loving, but very disorganized. She played with us, cooked, and then watched TV. When she had to leave, she tucked us in bed and told us not to open the front door to anyone. Back then, we didn't understand why not. Yes, we were idiots and still are. But we promised to do as she said. She left and made sure the door was locked. Half an hour later, I heard some strange noise. At first, I thought it was Carla maybe leaving something and coming back again to pick it up because it usually happens to her. But then I heard a knock and knew it wasn't her because she had keys. Being the little rebel I was, I walked to the front door and asked who was there. Then I heard some men whispering and laughing. At this point, I was scared. Not only because I disobeyed Carla, but because of the men. I think I heard two or three voices, who knocked and didn't respond to my question. I didn't know what to do and just ran to our room, locked the door, and hid under the bed. I didn't wake my little brother because I didn't want to scare him. The knocking continued for what appeared to be an eternity, and then suddenly stopped. I was still feeling uneasy, so I didn't go check. Several minutes had passed and I thought they were gone and we were safe. How delusional. I went to check the front door and as I was walking I caught something moving outside through the window. It was pitch black. But when I looked out, I nearly shat myself. Two men were climbing up the tree as tall as the roof of our house. Then it clicked. They were trying to break in. There was a small door on the second floor of the house that led to the roof once past the stairs. There my mom had her plants because they needed a lot of sunlight to grow. But she only went to check on them once a week. So how would they know to go inside that way? I still don't know. The moment I saw that, I ran. I ran as fast as I could to our room, locked it as I did before and put some heavy boxes of toys in front of the door in case they came. My brother woke up because of the loud noises and asked me what I was doing, told me to stop it and went back to sleep. He didn't even care. The front door opened and I heard my parents' voices. I moved the boxes. That took me some time and I ran to greet them. My dad asked me why I wasn't asleep, and before he tried to scold me, I told him that there were people on the roof and we needed to go. He obviously didn't believe me, but he went to check. When he returned, he said there was no one there, scolded me, and told my mom I had a very crazy mind. The next morning, as my brother and I went to the kitchen to get some pancakes, my parents were silent and seemed preoccupied. I asked them what was going on and my dad pulled me away and told me that two of my mom's plants were broken, as if someone had stepped on them. But he still refused to believe me because he thought that I did it on purpose. That day my dad put an alarm, just for security, and some cameras in case someone really tried to break in. I was reprimanded for a week because I lied to them and because I killed my mom's plants. Still can't forgive them for that and they still refuse to believe that. I tried to forget what I saw, but it's just not possible. I still feel shivers down my spine when I think of that night. This happened a couple of years ago when I was a senior in high school living in Southern California. It was later in the evening, sometime between 8 and 8.30, and my mom and I had just gotten home from a long day of driving and visiting family to discover that our cat was completely out of food. I was tired of being in the car by then and did not want to go to Petco to get cat food. 
My mom begged me to go with her, so I finally caved in and said yes. Looking back now, I'm so grateful that I did. Because if I hadn't decided to go, I think there's a good chance my mom would have never came home. Another important detail I want to mention is that the windows on the car my mom was driving were extremely tinted, making it pretty much impossible to see into the car. So we pull into the parking lot of Petco, and I look around and notice there's a few other cars, with one parked a few rows to the back of us. My mom says I can wait in the car since she's going in really quick to pick up the food. A minute after my mom walks out of the car and is halfway to the store, the car that was parked a few rows back pulls up to the spot right next to our car on the passenger side. I think it's a little strange, but think maybe the person wanted a closer spot to the store. A man steps out of the car and gets his big German Shepherd out of the back of his car and walks into the store. I'm looking inside the store and notice this guy is watching my mom and following her around, but not enough for her to notice. He gets ahead of her in line and he checks out and stands outside the entrance and is watching her check out. My mom walks out of the store and the guy starts walking behind her. At this point I'm starting to get a really bad feeling and I'm very creeped out. When my mom makes it back to our car she opens the back to put the cat food in and the guy opens the back of his car, right next to us, and starts talking to her and motioning for her to come look at something in the back of his car. My mom, being completely oblivious, takes a few steps over and is trying to look in the back of his car. His hands start to move towards his waist and I immediately start yelling for her to get in the car right now. The guy looks super shocked as I'm guessing he never saw me in the car and he stops talking to her. My mom looks very confused, but after I yell at her some more to get into the car, she finally does. The creepy guy immediately gets into his car and drives off in a hurry. When my mom gets into the car, I ask her what the guy was saying to her, and she tells me that he was telling her to look at something he got for his dog that was in the back of his car. I tell her everything I observed and that I'm pretty sure he was trying to abduct her. So, this happened about a year ago. I like to dog sit for my coworkers in the hospital for extra cash. One of the nurses wanted me to dog sit for her while her and her family went out of town. I had done this many times so I had no problem dog sitting alone. She lived in a very nice area of town so bad things weren't likely to happen. Or at least I thought. She told me that her husband was a police officer for the city they lived in but his guns would be locked away. She also went on to tell me that they have a security system that will record anything by all doors. She gave me the lock information if I needed it, but I insisted that I should be fine. Fast forward to me dog sitting. The first couple of nights were fairly normal. It was a big house, so it was a little creepy, but nothing I haven't dealt with before. One night, me and my boyfriend at the time were watching TV in the living room. The blinds were all open to the backyard. It was most likely around midnight since me and him both work night schedules, and we saw a light flash through the yard, but it wasn't a car passing by because it was angled down to the grass. The dog was in a kennel since he was a pup and needed to be in for sleep, so the dog wouldn't have been able to go find someone. Well, we both noticed it, so we decided to go outside and check it out. But there was no one. Absolutely nothing or no one. So naturally, we went back to bed as it was getting late. While laying in the bedroom upstairs talking, we heard a door shut from downstairs. I immediately shushed my boyfriend at the time and said, Did you hear that? And he said, Yeah, but I don't know what it was. He gets up to lock the bedroom door and turn off the lights. He whispers to me, Be quiet and listen. We sat in the dark room shaking. We heard yet another door shut downstairs. He tells me, Call the cops, as he grabs a lamp at bedside and stands by the door. As I was on the phone with the operator, she tries to calm me down, telling me officers were on their way to the scene. Then we heard the footsteps of our invader coming up the stairs to where we were at. I started to quietly cry 
telling the lady on the phone the person was upstairs with us now. We heard a knock at the door and footsteps going back down the stairs. I cried telling the lady there's a knock at the door. She reassured me that it was the cops, but I had to come downstairs to let them in. I told her, You're insane. A person is in the house and you want me to go downstairs? She tells me that it's protocol to let them in to search. So me and my boyfriend ran down the stairs as fast as we could and opened the door, lamp still in hand. We opened the door for the cops and told them there is someone here and what we heard. They walk into the house telling us to wait outside while they investigate. One officer goes straight outside to the back and yells out into the dark, If anyone is out there, make yourself known. Me and my boyfriend heard rustling through the bushes near us. The officers didn't find anyone in the home, but we know there was. We heard what we heard. Fast forward a couple of months later. We're watching a movie about an invasion, I believe it was called Open House, on Netflix. And we're talking about our experience together. Come to find out, the same day of the invasion, I believe I met the intruder. I remember I was outside around morning time getting ready to get in my car, when a young man walking by asked me if the car in the driveway was for sale. I said, I'm not sure I'm dog-sitting for them, but they should be back in a few days. He thanked me kindly for telling him and walked off. I looked at the car in the driveway next to mine and it didn't have a for sale sign anywhere. I had no idea what I had done at the time, but I know that the man walking by was our intruder. I still am afraid to dog sit again. This is a story I grew up hearing my mom telling me. I was really young when this happened, and I know for a fact it was before I was five. I only have some foggy memory of the event, especially because at the time my mom didn't want to freak me out. Some context. First, we have a family like all over the country. I remember spending so much of my childhood just on road trips from state to state to visit family so we know our ins and outs of traveling. Two, when I was a child, I would randomly hug strangers and tell them that I loved them. I was so filled with joy and love that it spilled over onto other people. There was basically only one stranger I never immediately latched onto the second I saw them. And this is that story. My mom was taking me to visit some relatives while my dad was staying at home with my brothers. She had to go a house sit and in general is a better caretaker of me than my father, so it made sense that I went with her. We were driving for hours until we finally hit a rest stop and got out to use the restroom. Now, there was already this guy in the parking lot, and according to my mom it looked like he was watching everyone who was entering and leaving the rest stop. The second we got out of the car, he did too. My mom held my hand as we went into the restroom, but immediately picked up on the fact that I had let go of her hand to hold on to the other hand, the side away from this man. Looking back, she told me that it was clear somewhere in my tiny child brain that I picked up on some sign of danger because I avoided the man as much as I could and would quicken my pace to the restroom and car. I never did that with a stranger ever again. I had never blatantly avoided another adult like that. Anyway, we do our business and head back to the car, and the man had gone back to his car and was watching us leave, only then to follow us in his own car. My mom immediately realized what was going on and tried to shake him off on the highway. He wouldn't budge and tried to get as close as he could. Apparently while doing this, a semi-driver noticed how frantic and off she was driving and could see her looking back at his car. He realized what was going on and drove up to the side of her and kind of made eye contact with her, and they were on the same page from then on out. Turns out the driver called up on his radio to the other drivers and told them what was going on, and a bunch of drivers from different routes nearby came onto the same highway we were traveling on. A few minutes later they begin blocking out the guy's car and essentially trapping him away from my mother, 
and as she turned on an exit to get off the highway at another rest stop, the original truck driver followed us in. He got out and talked to my mom and told her he picked up on what was happening, asked us if we were okay, and drove us to a Burger King and got us something to eat. We talked, and he followed us back onto the road until eventually we went our separate routes. My neighborhood in town has a long highway that I drive on for about 15 minutes before turning right on my street. The further you drive on the highway, the emptier it gets, as you're getting further and further away from the center. It was about midnight and I was returning home from a chill party at a friend's house. I was on the highway for about five minutes when I noticed a jerky movement at a bus stop. I slowed down and noticed there was a middle-aged man, a woman, and a little girl about five or so. He was punching her repeatedly, so I stopped the car immediately and called the police. As I pull over, the man notices and stopped hitting her. As I called the cops, I kept observing from a distance. Keep in mind that I live in Midwestern South America, so a lot of times calling the police doesn't help at all. The cops sounded like they didn't care a lot about the call, but they said they were coming anyway. The man seemed really anxious due to the fact that I had caught him in plain aggression, and the woman kept one hand on her bruised face and another holding the little girl's hand. It occurred to me that the man could be armed, so I felt I could not just go away knowing what had happened. So I waited for the cops. The man kept staring at my car and seemed very distressed. The 1am bus arrived and he pushed the little girl inside, but stayed on the bus stop. As the bus left, he started to slowly walk towards me. I froze and my mind started racing, not knowing if I should leave or stay there waiting for the cops. But before I could make a decision, he ran into a random alley between the houses and I lost him. I called the police once again. They still sounded like they didn't care and said, Yeah, we'll go. Keep in mind this was over an hour after the first call. Since no one was there anymore, I decided to go home and file a report in the morning. But as soon as I turned on my car, a big SUV came at the speed of light and pulled up right next to me. I almost shit my pants as I see it's the same guy. He asks me if I called the cops, and instinctively I tell him no. He just says, that's what I wanted to hear. The cops never did show up. At the time, I was a sophomore in college and a pretty big stoner, like pretty much everyone else at our school. It was a Sunday night and my friend Chris and I were driving to our friend's dorm in a different community. We were both pretty stoned, having just smoked a pretty big blunt, so we wanted to play some Fortnite. As high as we were, we didn't realize that we had actually parked in the wrong lot and proceeded to attempt to enter the wrong building. It was really dark and really cold outside as we go to school in Binghampton, upstate New York. We were shuffling with our heads down from the car to the door of the dorm. We didn't live in our friend's living community, so we had no access inside and didn't want to bother our friend by making him come all the way down to let us in. So we decided to just wait outside for someone to come and let us in like we always did. We waited there for about five minutes until we see this kid in black sweats and a black hoodie come into the hallway and he's walking to the door. He was walking really quickly, with a blank stare on his face. At the time, I thought nothing of it. That was until he opened the door for us. On his way out, I held the door and said, Thanks so much, bro. You're actually a lifesaver. And I will never forget the look he had in his eyes. Saying absolutely nothing back, his blank stare turned into the most deranged, sinister grin. My friend Chris noticed it as well. However, we both shrug it off as just weird. After that, we both figured out that we were in the wrong building and walked over to our friend's actual dorm. When we arrived in his room, everyone was in disbelief. The entire campus was on lockdown because there had been a stabbing in Wyndham Hall, which was exactly where Chris and I accidentally went, thinking it was our friend's dorm. 
I was pretty shaken by the fact that I was so close to someone getting killed at pretty much the exact time they were being killed. Within 10 or 15 minutes of arriving at our friend's dorm, details about the suspect were released on our university website. They described him as a light-skinned male wearing dark pants and a dark hoodie, which matched the exact outfit as the guy who let us in Windham. I was understandably at this point freaking out because of the previous interactions we had with the guy. Why did he give me the weirdest look when I told him he was a lifesaver for letting us in from the cold? Why do I say the absolute worst shit at the worst time? Then the next day all of my fears were confirmed. The police had the suspect in custody and released that it was Michael Roke, the light skinned black hoodie dude that was the guy that stabbed someone seven times in the neck and chest. And I called him a lifesaver right after he did it. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And if you want to help support the channel and get yourself some cool perks, make sure you check out the patron link in the description. I hope everyone's having a great day, and I really appreciate you checking out this video. And for those of you that have been catching my live streams, I appreciate y'all. I will catch everybody in the next video. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye. This is something that happened to me a few years ago, and it's sadly something that to this day still affects me. It all started one day after work. I got home and I realized that my roommate was sitting in our living room just relaxing and watching a movie. I went to my room, undressed, and went to go take a shower when I noticed they had left the toilet seat down, which, considering we're both guys, doesn't make sense to me and kinda upset me, especially since I have a note that says to leave the toilet seat up. I powered through my frustration, hopped in the shower, and went back to get dressed in something more comfortable. By the time I made it back out to the living room, my roommate had disappeared. It was already dark by this time, and I sat down on my living room couch, and to my left was a window that looked outside. The curtains were open, and it was pretty much pitch black outside. As I'm sitting there watching TV, I see movement outside the window. It's more just like a dark silhouette. I get up and turn the porch light on so I can try to see a little better. I see the silhouette duck behind my car in the driveway. At that time, I also noticed that my roommate's car is here, so I assume that it's just him trying to play a joke on me. I turn off the porch light and lock the door to make sure that he can't get back in, unless he has his key with him, obviously, but uh, I go back to watching my television show. Probably 15 minutes later, I start hearing noise in the back of the house, coming from my roommate's bedroom. I go back that way and knock on his door, and he answers it. I ask him how the hell he got back inside and if he just went through his window. He tells me that he's been in his room since I got in the shower. Now I'm starting to wonder what I did see outside. I let my roommate know that I saw something moving by our vehicles. That gets a fire under his ass and he pushes me out of the way, runs out front, turns the light on, and checks our cars. This is where the weird stuff starts. He calls me out to look at my car. So I put my shoes on and head out there. Someone had stolen my license plate and slashed his tires. He starts asking me if we should call the police and I tell him that would probably be a good idea. He runs inside to get his cell phone and says he called the police and they should be on their way shortly. I start to walk around the property to see if anything else has been messed with. He tells me he'll wait up front for the police to arrive. As I make my way to the backyard, our neighbor next door must have heard me open the gate, and he starts yelling over, Hey neighbor, you want to check out my wiener dog? This guy is always trying to get me to look at his wiener dog. I've only seen it about a dozen times, but uh, it gets a little old. I yell back to him, No, Butch, I don't want to see your wiener. His normal response is, Hey man, come check out my wiener, dude. It's real cool. You're going to like it. He cute. 
I ignore him and continue looking at the property and notice there's no other damages done. As I'm walking back up front, Butch tries one more time to get me to look at his little wiener. But I reassure him that I'm sure the wiener looks the same as the last time I saw it. I get back up front and notice that my roommate's knelt down by my car. I ask him what's going on and he jumps up really quick like I caught him doing something wrong. And then he tells me that it looks like my tires are slashed now too. I walk up to him and sure enough, now my tires are slashed. I ask him how the hell that's possible if he's standing right here and he smiles and tells me that he never called the police. That it actually was him outside and he just slashed both of our tires and stole my license plate. Just then Butch comes over with his wiener dog and says, yo guys, check out my wiener. I am beyond frustrated at this point and the only thing that can take my mind off of this is some nice steak and cheese taquitos. So I go inside to make some. And I notice that my roommate ate my taquitos. That was the last straw. You can slash my tires, you can do all this other crazy stuff, but you do not mess with a man's steak and cheese taquitos. So I went and grabbed his Chia Pet. I started pouring vodka all over it. His Chia Pet was his prized possession. Once it was thoroughly soaked in alcohol, I went outside and threw it at him and Butch. He breaks down in tears and asks how I could do such a thing, how that was a gift from his mother who had passed away. I tell him he shouldn't have eaten my goddamn taquitos. And then he says something that still chills me to the bone. You ate those taquitos last night, dick. And that's when it hit me. I did eat the taquitos last night. The end. Taquitos. Those are pretty good. You know what I mean. Yeah, taquitos. And I feel bad for that poor little wiener. No one wants to look at that poor little wiener dog. Poor little wiener.